So, uh, for instance, um, we're speaking about the uh, building of democracy, mm -hmm. and uh, yet uh, there is a concept that today mm -hmm. a lot of governments, a lot of people who come to power, uh, they have. They, they proclaim that they have democratic views, mm -hmm. they respect elections, mm -hmm. they have parties, but in the end, it's more or less a facade of democracy. Mm -hmm. In the end, everybody already, already know how to rig the elections, mm -hmm. how to not let the opponents to the media, mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, have just the party who doesn't really consult uh, the population. Uh, and. This, ref this idea of the freedom, freedom of speech, and all the reforms are often kind of considered as something annoying, enforced by the West, which we have to do to cooperate with the Western allies. That's a definite problem. There's a rise of populism, uh, populist nationalists in many parts of Eastern Europe, and you know you see signs of this in Western Europe and even in the United States right now. Uh, a democracy is a really complex thing, a liberal democracy, because it needs a, a clean, impartial state uh, to deliver services and protect the population. It needs a rule of law which limits the power of the state and it needs democratic elections accountability to make sure the state responds to the interests of the whole people and what's happening is these populists are using their democratic legitimacy to undermine the other two parts. So they corrupt the state, you know, they make the state their own piggy bank, you know, for their own business interest, they uh, get in bed with businessmen, oligarchs that you know want to use state power to protect their businesses and vice versa, uh, and they really hate the rule of law because the rule of law prevents them from doing what they want. It, shields them from accountability. And so this is the pattern you're seeing in Hungary and Poland and Turkey, uh, and I think even in some respects in the United States, uh, where these populist leaders are using their popular mandate to weaken the other uh, institutions of liberal democracy. Uh, but if we also um, speak about um, Ukraine, I ask him about this kind of play with the West. Mm -hmm. When the people say that, okay, uh, we will follow the reforms, we'll do that, but mm -hmm. in fact, the state building is more important, especially when we're living in a turbulent times. Mm -hmm. For instance, in case of Ukraine, we definitely have a Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can make some compromises. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe temporary, mm -hmm. but unless we have a war, we have we can do compromises on freedoms, on some other things, and that will be sorted out later. You know, the state building has good aspects and bad aspects. Its bad aspects is when the government uses war as an excuse to clamp down on criticism, on journalists, on opposition groups that may, you know, object to things that it's doing. Uh, on the other hand, you know, wars are very serious in terms of creating national identity and a certain sense of unity. So, uh, in Ukraine. I, I see both of those things going on. Uh, I do see the war you know, being used uh, to some extent by the government as an excuse for not addressing certain kinds of reforms that are, are necessary because really the state needs to be not just strong in a repressive sense, it needs to be strong in the sense of being you know, a clean institution that can actually respond to public interests rather than the private interests of you know, oligarchs or well-connected people. Ukraine after the revolution, we had a lot of advisors coming, for instance, from Eastern Europe who looking to the example of the reforms of the 90s in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Slovakia. Uh, yet, that was right after the communist time. There was not the uh, reforms in the oligarchic mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. uh, which you know sometimes require privatization and other things. In Ukraine, everything already is owned mm -hmm. uh, by somebody. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you see the difference? How do you see to what extent that kind of just just usual things shouldn't be copy pasted. Well, I think that's right that the way that privatization was done in the 1990s allowed oligarchs to basically capture very large parts of the economy and they still are dominant in Ukraine. Uh, that didn't happen in the Czech Republic and Poland and Hungary, uh, although now in Hungary you're kind of getting the emergence of new oligarchs because of, you know, Orban's policy. But in Ukraine, uh, it's a legacy 
cheap. I think the only way that you can deal with it is by introducing more competition. You know, there needs to be more small and medium-sized businesses growing up that are not part of this oligarchic system. There need to be more multinationals uh, investing in Ukraine. Uh, that's the only way I think you chip away at that domination of the economy by, by this oligarchic structure. There was a lot of help coming to Ukraine with conditionality mm -hmm. uh, from, for instance, IMF. And uh, we hear, you know, some contradictory advice uh, because sometimes it's about building a stronger state and institutions, supporting institutions, you know, um, helping, teaching civil servants, all the things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, from the point of uh, view of economy, mm -hmm. it's a lot about that the state should give Give, uh, g give that to the private sector, to the business. And especially, we understand that today that mm -hmm. the, the business could be very ruthless and the competition could be really unfair mm -hmm. when the state uh, regulation may be sometimes required. Mm -hmm. So really, what are also your concerns? Mm -hmm. And if we speak about that way of uh, dealing in, in this part of the world mm -hmm. uh, with the reforms, uh, with at the same time idea that we need to have a stronger state, mm -hmm. but at the same time economically, there are the demand to have a weak state. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think that people are mixing up two different concepts. So a strong state is necessary, uh, not in the repressive sense, but in the sense of having the capacity to do something like regulate, you know, water, electricity, roads, you know, to actually deliver services in a city uh, so that the roads are paved and there's, you know, access uh, to health care, all these things. I mean, that's my definition of strength. It's not that you can put journalists in jail, it's that you can can actually uh, do things. But at the same time, the state's scope needs to be restricted because states really have no, I mean, the, the government has no business owning a lot of profit-making businesses that are much better done by private sector actors. And so I don't think it's a contradiction to say you want a capable state that's able to regulate, uh, to make sure that businesses don't exploit their position uh, at the expense of ordinary citizens. And so I think you can both simultaneously want to strengthen the state. Uh, in terms of its capacity, but also restrict its scope in terms of the kinds of things that it does. You know, there's there's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of bureaucracy in Ukraine that really drives away investment and makes you know people. Uh, uh, less willing to put money into it because they're not certain, you know, what's going to happen uh, in the future. After communism, it would be a different state and the capitalism would work, but like we have, and it would open the society, but we have China mm -hmm. becoming more oligarchic mm -hmm. and like a lot of countries in Eastern Europe and in Africa and elsewhere and also in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So really, what are the key things? to uh, well, fight oligarchy. There has to be a clear separation between you know, a state official and their public responsibility and then the private interests of that official. Uh, and if you mix the two up, uh, you're gonna get you know, really big, uh, big problems. You don't want people going into politics to protect their business interests and vice versa. Uh, so without naming any names, you know, we have a version of that in our country where for the first time we've had a businessman elected president who who has not given up his business interests and uh, you know he seems to be benefiting himself in the way that he uh, acts but as I said you know the ultimate solution to the problem of oligarchy in, in in Ukraine is more competition. You know, you need a, a vigorous private sector that's not dominated by these well-connected, you know, semi-political oligarchs. You need uh, multinational companies. You need small and medium-sized enterprises. You need the possibility that you can start a new business, uh, let's say, in the IT sector, and that it can grow without being interfered with politically. I think that's ultimately going to be the solution. And we do have a president who is one of the richest men in the country, which. Actually, he has his business and he runs, so, uh, and it doesn't look like there is any choice that he would give uh, away his, uh, what he owns or he would run. So still, it's so interconnected. Mm -hmm. And like, is it the rule that the people with that amount of money just don't go to politics? Well, it's going to be hard to impose that kind of rule yeah. you know, retroactively. So I think it, it's a norm that really has to evolve over time. I mean, you need to elect a different you know, type of politician. I think down the road, um, so that that you know that distinction is uh, is observed. As I'm saying, unfortunately, this seems to be a trend in a lot of countries where 
people with money use their money to get political power and people with political power use it to protect their money. Uh, and that, uh, you know, is something in law that, that needs to be addressed because that's, that's not a good development. Uh, and if we also speak about the democracy and the way it's run in terms of elections, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more we see everywhere that it's not any longer than I, uh, the battle for an ideas when you would like to uh, persuade a majority. Mm -hmm to join your idea. It's rather that you're looking at your small uh, crowd and you mobilize it, maybe uh, scaring with what could happen. And in the end, uh, the, we have a number of politicians which you know, are fighting for maybe 10, 15, or 20 percent of the votes, mm -hmm. which never majority, but then they run mm -hmm. the country, uh, and, and 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 that's the whole the, the election system is, is is built in many countries today. That it's not any longer the party uh, which mm -hmm. you know have uh, the real majority. Uh, so, what do you think with the way the elections are organized? All countries need strong political parties, and one of the problems in Ukraine is you haven't developed those kinds of political parties. So, uh, part of it is a result of presidentialism, that uh, presidentialism tends to encourage individual candidates who build platforms around themselves rather than around a party. Uh, and so if you, you know, went back to a more parliamentary system, the incentives would shift uh, and give par parties more uh, power. But it's also partly a um, you know, a cultural thing that people need to learn to cooperate. Uh, you know, one observation that I would make about more liberal types of candidates in many parts of the world is they don't cooperate very well. You know, they're very individualistic and they haven't been able to build a single party organization that can represent people that want a pro-Western, pro-European uh, point of view. And I think in Ukraine in particular, it's really important that that kind of an organization be built with a clear platform so that people have a real choice, you know, to, to vote for that kind of a future. You talked to a couple of currently um, younger Ukrainian MPs mm -hmm. who cited in Stanford. And uh, um, so what are the, the things, uh, would say, you advising to the younger politician coming to this very mean, mm -hmm. very, uh, let's say, hostile mm -hmm. uh, political environment mm -hmm. where actually should be not just idealistic, mm -hmm. uh, but where you need to sometimes, you know, understand the rules of these games, or, or you you are marginal, you are a loser. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are several. I mean, this is advice I'd give to anybody. Uh, first of all, you need an organization. You know, you have to be able to not just win an election. You have to be able to govern once you win the election. Uh, that means that you need people that, you know, can not just get out the vote, but can develop policy platforms. You need an appeal. Uh, one of the truths about, unfortunately, democratic politics is that people don't vote rationally. It, it, that is to say, they don't have clear ideas of what they want, and they choose candidates based on who's going to support those ideas. They start with the emotions, and so you do need to appeal to people on this, you know, emotional, uh, emotional level. Uh, but you really um, have to get ready for governing and it's not just about you it really is about creating a movement that can mobilize large numbers of people and i think again this is something that is advice for more liberal politicians. A lot of them tend to be based in cities among educated people, you know, who are middle class or professional. And in most countries, you can't win an election on that basis. You know, you need to be able to appeal to people that live out in the countryside, that are less educated, that are not part of this, you know, urban uh, elite group. Uh, and that uh, is something that you know, requires reaching out beyond your comfort zone in many cases. And do you think, and that would be sometimes an argument from some, that you really can do that uh, without a, a, a significant amount of money, uh, which are so usual for campaigning, because the system is built on that. The system is built on ad, on polls, on everything. And if even you have a, a great political idea and you're genuine and you need to talk to the places, without the backing, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't make it. Well, that remains to be seen. There's other sources of money, and I think the media environment is changing. So social media is displacing television everywhere as a way of communicating. 
Uh, so I think there are other possibilities that can get around some of the dominance of big money in these kinds of campaigns. We've seen it in the United States and in Britain and other places, and I think Ukraine is going to go down that path as well. The more we see the way uh, uh, the elections are running, it's all about the gathering the data. It's in fact very focused, but it's aimed on so little people in the end, uh, and that's happening in the U.S. It's actually how the Obama campaign was was run to some extent. Uh, that's what very much used by the Trump campaign, and we've seen it globally as well. First of all, I'm not sure that that's actually the way you win an election these days. There's a lot of concern about Cambridge Analytica and the way they use this micro-targeting. Nobody has empirically proven that that actually was a successful uh, effort uh, because a lot of the people they were reaching were convinced already and you really didn't need to you know bombard them with more of these micro targeted ads uh, I think in general it's still the case that if you don't broaden your base of support uh, to people that you know are outside of that group that you're targeting, uh, you're not going to win an election. Uh, Donald Trump didn't win simply by appealing to this core 35% of the population that really loves him. He had to win over enough people in the middle in order to get past the, you know, the, the in order to win certain key states. And I think that's still the case in, in most elections. You need a coalition. You need to appeal to, you know, a number of social groups that, you know, aren't necessarily your fanatical supporters. We, we have Russian aggression in Ukraine. We have Russia rising as an international power to be there, to be heard. The aggression would be always a legitimate excuse uh, for not doing something. To what extent, actually, in such circumstances, the, the country is able to do something, having that neighbor, having that outside threat, just succeeding as, as a reform country? Yeah, I, I don't think that the Russian aggression should stop the uh, possibility of reform. If you look at South Korea, they've had North Korea on their border. They've not settled that war. They're still technically at war with one another. There's still a heavy you know, uh, militarization of their border uh, with lots of conflicts over now nuclear weapons and so forth. South Korea has spent 25% of its budget on the military, much higher than most other countries, and yet it's been one of the most successful growth stories and democracy stories uh, over the last 40, 50 years in the world. So, you know, it can be done, and there's there's actually something sometimes useful about being at war because it does tend to shape a sense of national identity. Uh, I think that Ukrainians are clearer that they're not Russians and that they've got their own identity that's separate from that, uh, much much more so today than they did, you know, five years ago before the war started. Uh, at the same time, you know, the wounds which the society received mm -hmm. in terms of grievance, in terms of, you know, uh, the separation and the confrontation which hadn't been here. Mm -hmm. Because in the long run, uh, Ukrainians would, should find a way to deal with the people who fought against the Ukrainian state but are Ukrainian citizens, mm -hmm. you know, those who also supported the annexation of Crimea, and also the actual fight had happened and the sure. people had, um, had uh, died. So uh, that is the way that it, it, it brings some experience which we don't know. We know how long it takes for all the countries who lived through the war then to uh, heal those wounds because they come in nationalism, populism, you know, radicalism and all other things. Mm -hmm. That's where you need, I think, wise leadership, you know, where you have to have leaders that can build a national identity that's inclusive, uh, that somehow reincorporates all of those people uh, back into a national, you know, community. Uh, and that's very hard to do uh, other leaders you know really want to try to exacerbate those wounds and keep them alive for their own short-term interests and so I think it's uh, sometimes a matter of luck unfortunately which kind of leader a nation gets for many years you are answering on what was meant by the term the end of history and you're doing that I think for numerous interviews for many many years to what extent you think that this uh, Russian idea of postmodernism mm -hmm. of this nihilism where uh, the you know, that people become, started to believe that it's, it's indeed these democratic ideas, it's, it's a bit of a hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, 
Everybody's corrupt. You know, I don't think that you can build a society around nihilism, like you say. Uh, I think that if the Russian government tries to project this idea that everything is corrupt, it's going to come back to haunt them because people are going to stop believing in you know their own institutions. So I really don't think that you can build a successful society around these very cynical uh, ideas that simply want to weaken everybody else. Uh, eventually, that's going to come back uh, to haunt you. There is no Russian idea right now. I mean, what does Russia represent other than, you know, the opportunity for tremendous political corruption? It's not like communism. You know, communism, for all of its evils, was actually an ideal of a kind of society that was attractive to people in other places. And I just don't see that in the Russian idea right now. Uh, but it's attractive in other places. The well, no, no. The idea of nihilism is not attractive. What, what the Russians are doing is exacerbating existing polarizations and divisions and uncertainties within other countries. That's different from projecting an actual idea. That's simply, you know, trying to widen gaps that already exist. But that's not an idea around which you can build a successful society. Well, how would you explain this global lose of trust in the institutions? As the, the, the trust is, is really diminished well, in the U.S. So, so part of it is actually it's deserved, right? Both the United States and Europe went through major financial crises. The U.S. in 2008, Europe in 2010, 11, uh, and the suffering that was caused by that, you know, by ordinary people, was caused by elites that really made very bad policy decisions. And so, in many ways, it's actually rational for ordinary people to be resentful of the way that elites have managed uh, uh, public policy. So I do think that you know, they need to, the, these elites really do need to look at their own actions uh, because, uh, you know, the other thing is culturally, uh, it's true that I think many elites look down on people that don't live in big cities, that have more traditional values uh, and the like. That's certainly what's driving, driving a lot of populism and support for Donald Trump in the United States. And I think that, you know, uh, that's not that's not a, a healthy attitude uh, towards you know ordinary Americans. Same thing in Britain. Same thing in you know many European countries. Um, and we, if we're coming back to Russia, you know the whole story of the and in particular, it's it's such a popular story legitimate, legitimately, uh, the story on the possible Russian collusion regarding the U.S. elections. So, what do you think on that? To what extent, actually, the uh, it could be exaggerated, and the powers and the uh, you know the power and the force of Russia is more or less exaggerated. To what extent they, in fact, could. Uh, could affect the um, the election in such a big country as the United well, States. It's possible that they did actually affect the outcome just because of the nature of our electoral system. So Hillary Clinton got almost three million more votes than Donald Trump, but we've got this electoral college. And the reason that Trump won is that he won in three critical states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And the margin of his victory collectively in those three states was only about 110,000 votes, which means that if 60,000 votes had gone the other way in those three states, Hillary Clinton would be president today. Is it possible that the Russians influence 60,000 votes? Well, it's possible, but we're never going to know whether that you know, actually happened. Uh, so it is possible to have this kind of effect. I think that probably in the future, they're not going to be nearly as successful. I think in the French election, they tried to undermine Macron, support the ma National Front, but it didn't work very well. Uh, so I think now that Western countries are vigilant about this kind of interference, you know, we can put up uh, immune systems to keep this kind of influence uh, minimized. Another thing where people don't feel confidence mm -hmm. is that international institutions doesn't protect them any longer. Uh, with the Russian aggression in Ukraine, which had happened in 2014, where in the 21st century, one country could in fact occupy the part of another country and nothing could be done, doesn't matter how, you know, how strong are the partners and allies, uh, despite all these uh, promises on the Budapest Memorandum, uh, there is really 
not, not any more confidence to an organization like, uh, let's say, UN, which, due to the system which is built, uh, there, is, there will be always a veto mm -hmm. on the questions like Ukraine and, for yeah. instance, Syria. So, it, to some extent, uh, there is a demand to, uh, let's say, challenge the current international order mm -hmm. uh, by Russia and by some other countries that we have to renegotiate. Uh, the world is concerned, should we really renegotiate? Mm -hmm. At the same time, definitely something should be changed, since it doesn't look like a very efficient system. Well, look, I've always believed that it depends which international organizations. The UN has never been able to protect countries from aggression. Uh, it's, it's built into the structure of the Security Council that if, if any of the disputes are among members of the Security Council, then they're simply going to veto anything that hurts their interest. And this has been the case you know, right from the beginning. Uh, so anyone that put their faith in the United Nations as protecting them from aggression, I think were just mistaken and naive. Uh, the th real things that protect people are military alliances like NATO, like the US-Japan, US-Korea uh, security guarantees that are underpinned by you know, very clear treaty commitments. And I think that you know, that was one of the reasons that Ukraine wanted to get into NATO. Uh, it didn't succeed in doing that, but I think in the end it's these kinds of geopolitical relationships that are going to uh, secure uh, the sovereignty of countries and not international organizations like the United Nations. Uh, but uh, what is significant is that somehow you, you let's say, uh, acknowledge and change your mind from the supporting the neoconservatism mm -hmm. and then uh, making an argument that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would ask to more or less explain that mm -hmm. uh, and as well say what you would say also to the people, public intellectuals, politicians who kind of change their ideology. Mm -hmm. Usually they'll just kind of pretend that they weren't existing before that because it's not in their nature to do that. Well, I think people, you know, uh, should be able to change their minds about things and they should be honest about those changes. So in my case, you know, I, I had a, uh, I started out as a conservative or a neoconservative. Uh, two things happened during the 2000s, the decade of the 2000s that changed my view. One was the Iraq War, which I think was the biggest foreign policy mistake the United States has made, probably even bigger than Vietnam. And the second was a financial crisis. Uh, both of these mistakes came out of conservative ideas. You know, the first was an idea that American power, especially military power, could be used to reshape a region like the Middle East. And the second came out of this belief, a kind of ideological belief that free markets could take care of themselves. And both of them were wrong. Uh, and both of them led to big disasters. And so I think when you see that an idea that you believed in you know, led to a really big uh, bad outcome in the world, you got to rethink those ideas. And so I don't apologize for that. I just think the world demonstrated that, you know, things that you once believed really didn't work out that well. How do you see the, the, current, uh, the current state of affairs in Ukraine in terms of politics and reforms? Every time I come, I leave more optimistic than you know before because I see that there's actually a lot of people with good ideas that really want to change the country and so uh, I think you know many of them are discouraged right now but I think that if they continue to work to cooperate to build networks to you know come up with agendas and realistic strategies that eventually they're going to win so uh, but do you see the really ideas because what we sometimes see that a lot of people come into the politics with the idea uh, for everything good against everything bad. Mm -hmm. And you don't have even voting. You don't understand. They are nice guys. But you don't understand what do they represent? What kind of system they would like to build? What kind of health care? What kind I, of foreign I policy? It's totally unclear, for instance, for us. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see that people are just running with the idea for everything good. Mm -hmm. Isn't it any just, just a bit of different kind of populism, but kind of a more positive populism in a way that... <laughs> Well, look, I mean, the ones I deal with, I think, have pretty specific ideas for things that they would like to change. Uh, so I don't think that's a fair characterization. I think that, you know, uh, there's been a lot of work done in thinking through the specific requirements of Ukraine and what is the next stage of reform. And so, you know, I, I'm not that cynical about it. <laughs> so if you would single out some couple of maybe, you know, the priority at this stage while talking to different people, while looking at Ukraine mm -hmm. in terms of the 
change, which is necessary. Well, I think most people would put judicial reform at the top of the list. You know, there really needs to be strong structures that are very independent of the political forces in the country that can really hold officials accountable. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the economy, there really needs to be a land reform uh, because there's a lot of hidden assets that are locked up and unavailable, you know, that uh, could spark a lot of growth in this country. Uh, I think those would be two things that would be at the top of my list. Well, I think Ukraine is very symbolically important to the entire region because it's a country that's trying to break away from its Soviet and Russian past. It wants to orient itself towards Europe. It has a right to do that. Uh, I think that uh, Putin understands that this is what's at stake, and that's why he wants to stop it from happening. So I think that Ukraine has a significance that goes way beyond Ukraine. And if it succeeds, uh, other countries will be take heart from that, and if it fails, uh, they're going to get discouraged. So I think that's, that's why Ukraine is a very important country right now.